Grammy da fã do Brasil. Tá merecendo, tá? Tá merecendo. Fã do Brasil. of relationship between the military and the citizens, and number two, how this then gives better check and balances, and lastly, thirdly, transparency. What does status quo look like? Status quo look like that the military leaders are often elected internally via promotions. The problem with this are threefold. Number one, there are no check and balances via external measures. Number two, leads to the lack of transparency. Things like nepotism will run rampant within the military system itself. But also number three, that the military will tend to pander to corporation due to the military industrial complex. More on this later. Three pieces of framing. Number one, the role of military in the nation is important and big. This looks like them playing an important role when it comes to setting up the defense of the nation. This is important especially when it comes to the threats of security to the nation that is extremely proximate and a threat towards the livelihoods of these citizens. Number two, this looks like in times of crisis, militaries are the one to have the threat for war, to have to be the one to set up surveillance, especially in declaring a martial code by the state. But this also looks like, independent of war, these military are also people who are going to be the ones to be taking care of the security of the citizens. This looks like in COVID-19, where when the state declares an emergency declaration, the militaries are the ones that go out to ensure that people are stay safe and kept at home. This looks like during flash flood, flash flood the militaries are being then um, sent to the grounds to ensure that people are safe during these kinds of floods. But on a principal level, why the role of military is something that's important? We see that in historical precedents, the military has been one of an emblem of the nation's pride, the nation's patriotism. This looks like a lot of the state propaganda within war times last time that usually builds up people to say that if you want to make your nation prideful, join the military. How it looks like right now in status quo is that military is often being looked as what it represents the state as. Meaning that when you view a state, you often view their military as well meaning there's already an inherent relationship between the military and patriotism and nationalism. Second piece of framing, the info slides say that military leaders will still be subjected to the authority of civil leaders. But I'd like to provide here a piece of nuance, which is that the military in status quo, more than not, um, can pander towards other external stakeholders as well. And given that this debate happens in a world of a democratic country, we think that this means that this particular that the executive branch of the state will also look towards the military to ask for advice when it comes to declaring war, when it comes to crises of like threat of national security. This means that in so far as we tell you that these military often than not get large funding from corporations, especially corporations that make weapons or corporations that fund this military because things like territorial expansion, things like making the military um, alive is what that benefits this corporation. This means that corporations have a large incentive to give a lot of money to this military to keep them alive. In so far as we tell you that the state seeks military for advice, this looks like, the Ameri this looks like America seeks the uh, military advice when it comes to invading Iraq. This means that the military themselves, because they are often are not backed by the corporations, there's a symbiosis relationship between the military and corporations. This means that military has a lot of incentive to want to pander and cater to those corporations. So if corporations are largely pro-war, military will also be like that, just so that they can continue to be alive. This then contributes to the whole military industrial complex, but a symbiosis relationship of the military and the corporations largely then will often or not overrule what is it that the public sentiment wants. Even if at the cost of public sentiment, when public sentiment just wants peace, public sentiment just wants the defense of the national, this more than not overrides it because we live in a capitalistic structure where these kinds of things are viewed as more important. Third piece of framing is that the debate must happen in a world where democracy is something that's still viable because otherwise there won't be any debate because this, you still have to use elections as a the mechanism. Therefore then, um, secondly, 
how do elections look like? Elections we think look like um, democratic elections. That means every four years you elect a new particular military leader. This was like before the democratic elections as well. There will be campaigns by these kind of military leaders. So as citizens are aware of who they're voting, these military leaders are likely to then showcase what their um, CVs are, what their manifestos are when it comes to like what are their principles and what is the kind of goals that they wish to achieve in a particular military during the third. This also looks like the state also now has an incentive to want to um, implement education, especially when it comes to civil awareness within schools, so that younger generations now, they are more aware of their civil obligation to want to vote. This means that people aren't likely to be voter apathy, people are actually want to go to vote. But we could see that even if we do have the short-term harm of people being apathetic towards these kinds of things, we think that these kinds of elections will be the tipping point to a lot of the benefits we have to accrue. This is because even in the short term, People don't care and we still get bad military leaders that continuously um, re-emphasize what status quo harms are going to be. <coughs> People will want change the point at which they see that these military leaders are going to be bad because there are going to be a lot of public discourse because a lot of these kinds of like, elections would then lead to people pu more public scrutiny. This means that people are more likely to then want to vote for better military leaders when it comes to in the future and the next term. Therefore, we concede the short-term harm, but we think that this is okay so far as it's proven to you that the long-term harm is going to be something that is good. Firstly, first argument on the justification of why this is okay. Why it's okay for citizens to vote for military leaders? Because number one, they're more proximate because when our military blunders, citizens are the ones that are going to suffer the most. This looks like if they go to war, they make the wrong misstep. This looks like if they don't do their job well when it comes to national security, citizens are alive because they're the ones that are going to be affected the most. Your economy is going to be fucked up, you're going to um, be constantly feel like in a state of paranoia. But this also looks like the uh, military reference the state. A parallel to this is that because a president is someone who plays a big role in the nation, therefore then a citizen has the democratic right to choose who their president is going to be. This means that it's also not just a for citizens to do so. On the argument of check balances, we think this combats imperialism because it breaks down the military industrial complex. Because now the military leaders will shift the pandering from the towards the corporations, now towards the public. Therefore then, it will now depend on public sentiment. If the general consensus now is that the public wants to have a more defensive strategy, this means that a large chunk of the finite resources that the state has now won't go towards the military, but rather will now shift towards other areas now because of the large chunk of political will being reflected by the elections show that people don't really want a lot of resources going to these kinds of like uh, military. But also next is that idea of transparency. Because right now, there's already a lot of chunks of problems and nepotisms and things like that. Meaning that if you allow these kinds of people to actually go and vote, this means that people consciously have to be in a state where campaigning periods are constantly being aired on television. Campaigning are often being aired as discourses within social media, Twitter and things like that. People will talk about these things. How we relate back to transparency is these are the things that will push people to learn more about the military, to learn about who they're voting for. Therefore then, this, this gives kind of incentive for the military leaders to also want to do better and be better and not to be complacent in whatever that to allow the problems to start to school to be run rapid. How this leads to more public scrutiny is because when people go to vote, there's an unconscious idea that the ballot that you put into will affect the kind of like nation policy and the kind of like military that's going to be. Therefore then, in the moment where people feel that the military fucked up, the comparative is here. In status quo, when military fucks up, people complain to the state, but that's it. But the comparative here is when the military fucks up in our world, the people realize that now they have an existing mechanism to actually do something about it. Therefore, then, more scrutiny is able to then go towards the kind of military leaders that fucked up, people are then likely to go towards these kinds of elections in the future. First F for the final speech. And call upon first This affirmative team is lazy. 
because principles don't work if they don't prove an end. Democracy is only useful if it provides freedoms and a meaningful choice. If we prove that it restricts freedoms and is not a meaningful choice, then their principle can't function. First, on setup, what does the process actually look like in the status quo and why? This, what the process looks like is just that the military is appointed by the head of state. There are two important things to know here. First, that it's a collaborative process between the military and the executive. That is, they often talk to each other and then make the decision in and of itself. But secondly, the head of state is publicly accountable and elects to a small number of people. So when the head of state is elected, they have access to a bunch of confidential information that wouldn't go into the public. So stuff like national security interests, stuff that is legislated by law to not go into the public, is stuff that the head of state does have access to and is able to make information on that basis. The first argument, or like the only argument, is why are they elected poorly? The first part of it is the most charitable like iteration of our engagement with that. That is, they don't have enough information. The first reason for this is that there's a bunch of confidential information that the public can't have access to. And I want to note that this is necessary to make decisions. There are a couple, a few examples of this. Firstly, this looks like troop deployment patterns. So whether or not they send troops to die in a risky way, this looks like to sending troops to a defenseless village, stuff like that. Second thing is this looks like whether they've been tried in a military court for war crimes. So this looks like just if they've done something wrong in the in the military, this looks like them going to the military court and what the military court made decisions on. Thirdly, this looks like the tactics that they've done. So like what they've done in war, what they've looked like done in terms of the stuff that like the plans that they made as the military. Note that this is never going to be released to the public. This is legislated in law to never be released to the public. So at the point in which the, this information is useful in knowing information about the military leader, the, the public will never have access to it in the first place. But secondly, even if you don't buy that, people just don't have in, enough understanding of military practices. So even if they have all of the information and it is released to the public, they're unable to understand it. The first reason to, for this is that it is hard to understand the minutiae and the nuance of military tactics. That is, policy is incredibly concrete, but military tactics are incredibly weird, or like unconcrete, in that when you go to a village, the way that you like deploy troops, the, like whether that's good for the nation in and of itself, is incredibly hard for the individual person to understand this. But secondly, it, they're just far more proximate things, stuff like healthcare, education, etc., which makes military under all of these things in terms of the calculus that individuals do in terms of their decision making. So, at the end of that, even if they have full access, they're unable to understand it. The impacts of this are a few. Firstly, you probably elect people that are unqualified or like unsuitable for the job in the first place. But secondly, you just elect bad candidates who run the military in bad ways. I want to weigh this against all of the stuff that AF says. AF says that it's okay, we're happy to concede a short-term harm. But every, the short-term harm is in and of itself harmful to many people. That is, if the military does make bad decisions and goes into that defenseless village that makes a bunch of people die, even if it is a short-term harm. The second part of my argumentation will deal with why this is a long-term sustained harm. The, the, the mechanism here, or the premise of this argument, is that people fall victim to populism. There are a few reasons for this. The first is that they concede or they model that there's an election campaign. That is, if there is an election campaign, the only thing that you have to judge the candidate on is their speeches, the way that they are public facing in the first place. So this looks like is the trend that has existed in current elections. That is, you have a lot of rhetoric, you have a lot of unsubstantiated claims that are being made by the, these leaders who stand on these platforms in the first place. So they use this flowery rhetoric, they use rhetorics of populism, they use rhetorics of majoritarianism in order to appeal to the broad base of people. What this looks like then is doing stuff like, firstly, creating free fear to empower the military. That is, that our country is under existential threat. This looks like, two, creating scapegoats, i.e. maybe placing a minority or like the LGBT people within a specific country. This looks like, thirdly, being incredibly ultra-nationalistic. So this looks like military leaders in India being like Pakistan is the biggest threat that exists within the nation. This is how you get over the proximity bias argument that I explained earlier. That is, people have things that are more important to them. So when you do things that appeal to individual intuitions, stuff like their nationalism, stuff like the fact their hate for another racial group within the country, we're able to better get over the biases that individuals have in terms of the distance that the military already has from the individual person in the first place. At that point specifically, there are incredibly bad impacts. But the framing for this argument is, as they say, most people are generally apathetic towards military 
military leaders in the first place. So, if most people are distant from the military, they think they don't make a good decision, they're unable to perceive the impact of the decision in the first place. So, the majority of individuals that opt into the election in and of itself are individuals that are most persuaded by the fear, they're most persuaded by the populism. They cannot say that you have rational decision making because the people that vote in the first place as per their own analysis are the people that are subject to this fear, subject to the populism, and all of that. The impacts of this are multiple. Firstly, it empowers the military to just act in harmful ways. There are two independent claims to this. The first is that they feel that they are empowered is that they've been elected on a democratic mandate. So, if they feel that they have the accountability in the first place, it empowers them to act in these harmful ways. In, in, like, yeah. The second thing is that you just elect more violent people. And the, the simple reasoning for this is that violence is what plays the individual's emotions. And the reason for this is just that people have a tendency to like like be like human psychology to like associate with the most visceral things. So if people have an like an already pre-existing bias towards viscerality, towards things that like persuade them in the first place, this will tend to be the intuition problem for this is just that people like action movies and people often opt into action movies that have a lot of violence. But the second thing is that it's just like harms minorities to an incredibly terrible way. So if you create fear, you create scapegoating, and your platform is based on the majority electing you, you are more likely to create these scapegoats, more likely to play into existing biases that individuals have in the status quo within specific countries. This looks like just harming minorities to an incredibly bad degree. This looks like being elected on the platform of harming these minorities, and therefore to stay in power, they have an active incentive to harm these minorities even more, because that is what got them elected. Therefore, to stay in power, they harm these minorities in the first place. The third thing is it just makes it much more likely that you get coups. And the reason for this is that when they are democratically elected on their mandate, they feel like they can run the government in the first place. At that point specifically then, you just make it more likely that coups do happen because the military feels like they have power and they feel like they're empowered in the first place. But the, the final thing to note here is that it just flips the military industrial complex argument because if the military runs on the platform of violence, runs on the platform of doing the worst things to the worst, like minorities and small individual groups within countries, they are, the corporations are more empowered to give them funding. That is the best case response. The worst case is just that this is symmetric, that the military industrial complex will always work and so fund the military in hopeful ways. So at the end of that, what you ought to buy is firstly, the military just gets a lot more violent because that is what plays to individual biases because they have other biases towards stuff like healthcare and education. If you place an explicit policy platform in the public's eyes, you have to get over the pre-existing biases that individuals have. But secondly, what this means is that violence in the military just gets even worse because of some like ultranationalism, because that is what like grabs people's attention, that is what makes the headlines in the electoral news cycle. But thirdly, it just harms minorities to a sufficient to an incredibly harmful degree because you scapegoat them and that is what you get elected on in the first place. For all those reasons, I think this is a terrible idea. Please negate. I thank the first lecture for the final speech. I'm also going to the lights it's very dark.
So this team runs a very mitigatory case. I think it gives you plenty of analysis of the problems in status quo of the existing military industrial complex and how this leads to the military leaders having to always cater to corporations, always having to cater to the same corporations that lobby the executive and lobby the military because these corporations can benefit off of these things. There is no response from the side of negative as to how in their world you are able to curb the limitations of like the corporate power within the military world and what that is going to look like on their side of the house. I want to respond to a couple of things. One, that people are going to make poor information, poor decisions because they don't have access to information. I don't think like access to who got who committed war crimes and what went on in like martial courts, like martial things like that, are things that the public does not have access to. But even if they don't, the things that the public are going to vote on is going to be blown, is going to be done based on the past experiences of this military leader. But in times of crises of the past, in like the military decisions that he had to make in the past, what were the steps that he took? What was his career like? Did he have like a political career or like some sort of thing before that? What his background is, what his stance on certain things are. The comparative then is that people just get elected based on nepotism. People get elected in who's who is able to able to cater and pander to corporations more, who is the most palatable character for the executive and corporations to just do whatever they want. They don't give you any analysis and mechanism of check and balance to tell me why the most capable people are going to be elected. If your problem is that people who get elected are going to like make terrible decisions and just be bad military leaders, I think we mitigate this on a couple of fronts. One, they are not the sole decision maker. The InfoSight tells you they, still, like, they are still subjected to the uh, civilian administration, right? So if they want to go to war and the president says no, then that's going to be a no. You cannot say that we are going to go to war and you're not going to because the democratic elections of the civilian angle happen like symmetrically on both sides of the house. But secondarily, if the problem is that that is going to be like bad in general, I think the public is also going to make decisions based on their past experience and how effective they were as administrations, as logisticians, as like strategic leaders in time of crisis. Let's look at our worst case here, that we just get bad military leaders and we get all sorts of bad decisions being done. But things is fine because now this process is something that is democratic. We can always vote them out five years from now. But they do a really bad job. Next time around, we don't vote for them. We don't vote for the people who are adjacent to the people who relate to them the most. We have the aging agency and the self determinant ability to vote these people out and put better people in. But secondarily, these people are not forced to be more transparent during the election process as well because you have to cater to the public. You have to go out there, you have to do interviews, you have to do debates. You have to to tell people why you are the better candidate compared to another person who has to be voted in as well. I mean, you're more likely to be open about the things that you do. So the problem is that they have some secret background problem that nobody knows about. These things are probably going to come out during the campaigning process so that people know that, hey, this is a problematic individual. We probably shouldn't vote for it. If they don't find out on their own, their opposite, like military leaders also running for the position, is probably going to use it against them anyway. Second thing I'm going to deal with is the idea that leaders use rhetoric for votes. They put a scapegoat individuals and they would use like populist narrative and things like that to make sure that the only people who go and work, people who really care about them. So you always get these pro-nationalist leaders and like the people just make bad decisions. A few, a few levels to this. One, your ordinary elections already happen like this. But not every country in the world is a populist, like ultra-radical nationalist nation because of democratic checks and balances that exist by allowing people to go and vote. So the executive already has some ability to enforce and invoke the same rhetoric upon people if the executive really wants to go to war. The importance here is the agency that you are now able to give to people when they have a direct democratic obligation and like ability to elect who is in charge of the military. Meaning, your corporations like Lockheed Martin and like BP always want more oil, always want to produce more weapons. They're always going to lobby the executive to turn these narratives against the people. They're always going to use whatever soft power they have to make sure that people are going to be pro-war, like pro-whatever policies that benefit them. So, if these things are the case, and there's nothing in status quo to prevent this from leaking into the military, because in status quo, it's a world where corporations want a military leader who's going to be pro-war, give pro-war policies, then that's exactly what you get, because there's nothing to stop these things from happening. They really have to elaborate to you what exactly the checks and balances are on their side of the world. On our side of the house, when you give people the agency to decide, this is when they can make the most informed choice. Because now you have two different individuals preaching two different things. Maybe one wants to say, let's go attack Pakistan, but another one is saying, Guys, we really don't have to attack Pakistan. We can put our money in more important things. We should really defund the military. We should not escalate the conflict in Kashmir. I think this is when you create an organic voice to let people know that 
there's something going on. You get better discourse on the side of the house because you have better informed like decision making processes that people can undergo. But the third thing here is they say the military is going to take over. I want to point out that this is a ridiculous claim to make. Yeah, yeah. There's no logical things whatsoever in this assertion for it to be true. One, the info side tells us that they are still subjected to the civilian leaders. So like if they say stand down, these people are likely to stand down. They don't tell us why the moment these people are democratically elected, they're going to have all the mandate in the world and they're just going to have the right to be able to like say let's rise up and like go overthrow the government and things like that. But secondarily, if people really agree with the military on the other side of the house and the ability to sway people is so great and the military says executive is doing a bad job, I don't understand why the immediate response of the people is to be let's overthrow the government because the military leaders have voted in said so. As you still have existing democratic election processes which means your response is going to be I trust the military guy because I wanted him, he's doing a good job, he's saying the state is doing a bad job. I think next election cycle, I'm going to vote against the person who's in charge right now. I don't understand why the military ability is suddenly going to be so great, it's going to supersede all forms of like democratic processes that already exist in status quo. I want to evaluate our claims on two levels here. One, are we principally justified in doing so? I want you to know that the response to this from first negative was just that principles don't matter if you can bring the practical impacts. Yeah, fair, but like poor people can vote and poor people don't get a lot of practical benefits and impacts from the state and even after poor people vote it's not true that the person that the poor person voted for is the one coming in power should we just take away the minority ability to vote should we just take away the people's ability to vote for like parties that have a very low chance of winning anyway i think regardless of the practical outcomes the principle still matters they can't just negate this by saying it was lazy what Ernsi tells you is that the military is proximate to the individual citizen at hand because when something bad happens these are the people with experience the most, the people involved in the military sent out the dying force is your ordinary average citizen. He tells you that in times of crisis, when you're going to war, when you're unable to defend your country, when the military is inefficient, unable to step in appropriately, this is when the people affected the most are the citizens. She also tells you that the military is just an emblem of the state. They represent the state in terms of international affairs when things get really bad. They need to they hold a sense of national pride to represent the best and the bravest of the individuals. All of this means that we are principally justified in choosing and having a direct say over who is in charge of the military. In status quo, we can do this indirectly because we vote in the executive and they sort of make a decision based on corporate lobbying and decide who is in charge of that. This is bad because for the most part, it happens behind the scenes through corporate structures and powers that put these people in charge. Anyway, I think we break this down to the point in which we have direct control over who gets to make what decisions in our military complex. I want to extend on this idea here because in status quo, there's a symbiotic relationship between corporations and the military. If people are unhappy with what's going on in the military, they make bad decisions, the executive has to take the blame because the military is simply just not in the light. No one blames the military just for the crimes that happen, they blame the, the executive for going to war, for making a certain strategic decision. So the only way for the public to regulate is to vote out the executive. But this doesn't solve anything because the corporate powers behind the scenes still have the same amount of sway and control over who gets to be a military leader. Insofar as your military leader caters and has pro-war policies and always like supports whatever corporations want, they want to go to war and like want to group expansionist and be territorial, these are the things that will always put them in power. I think it's uniquely on our side of the house that we're able to keep the military accountable, the point which the military leaders may take a more active stance in the decisions that they make. Because now they don't cater to Lockheed Martin, they don't cater to Shell, they cater to the individual on the ground. Maybe this makes them celebrities, makes them popular public figures, but it's still a democratic process. We can vote them out at the end of it. I think insofar as the people are accountable and we don't let private corporations run the country and make military decisions, it's a far better world on affirmative. team is one of comparativeness, because they suggest that lobbying exists in status quo, but they don't explain how this doesn't affect the rank of democracy. They say the military industrial complex exists now because there's military, uh, like, like corporate lobbying, but they don't explain why this is unlikely to occur under the side of affirmative. Truly, it is baffling that affirmative doesn't ever prove your path to victory. 
I'm first going to deal with democracy and whether or not this is something you principally care about, then accountability, and then in terms of our case. Let's talk about democracy, because they make the vague assertion that individuals ought to care about democracy as a principle, and that's an all be all of this debate. The first claim I'm going to make under this is that it's unclear if people actually do truly care about democracy. And I think this is the way you should adjudicate principles, because if the average reasonable person isn't going to buy the principle, it isn't something you as the judge should credit. The first claim I'm going to make is that it's unclear that democracy is truly important to a lot of people, and they made this claim at first affirmative, where they're like, there is existingly low voter turnout, which shows that there is a review of preference for individuals not to care about voting in the first place, even if it does materially affect them, even if it does proximately affect their living circumstances. It's unclear that individuals do care about affecting their circumstances to a large proportion such that you ought to care about this policy in the first place. I know that people have the capacity to understand that their vote is important. They know their vote can be impactful. They are told all the time that one vote does matter and they can swing elections, but there is just a revealed preference for them to be apathetic, to think that they shouldn't vote because they don't necessarily care about it regardless of how proximate it is. And I would note that there is a rising trend of political disengagement here, which should suggest to you that it's unclear that this principle is one that individuals truly do care about and you as the average reasonable person should. Second, let's talk about whether or not individuals care about specifically direct democracy, because this is the premise they failed to explain. Because we told you the counterfactual of indirect democracy is one that is sufficient and it truly is sufficient for a lot of positions that exist in status quo. Uh, note here, we do things that we don't vote for things like cabinet positions, we don't vote for things like the Minister of Transport, we don't vote for those that work in the RBA, we don't vote for individuals that work in the central bank. These are all things that we think are fine to delegate to indirect democracy because you truly do need a large amount of expertise and a large amount of technocratic, uh, technocratic uh, like understanding to be able to elect these things well. So this is a concession that society as a whole has understood and was acceptable to make. They explain, ah, oh, people ought to care about democracy as a whole, but it's unclear why we are undemocratic. Because to the extent that things like the Ministry of Healthcare is similarly proximate and can affect people, to the extent that the Agriculture and Trade Minister can do things like affect their food that individuals have access to, that can materially impact lives, and these are things that we don't elect now directly, it's unclear why there is a principal mandate to work beside the affirmative there. They truly don't explain this well. But the last thing I'm going to say here is to suggest that this is very, very contingent on being able to vote practically, which is to say, we explain why there are reasons why individuals don't vote, vote well in status quo, because they don't have complete understandings of military operations, because they don't understand what type of individuals they should vote, uh, vote for, because they might vote in bad ways and ways that don't aren't efficient for the military. We explain why individuals aren't free of coercive rhetoric like populism and fear-mongering on the side of problem, such that individuals don't actually activate their democratic benefit there. So even if this was a principal benefit, even if this was a principle you cared about, they don't fulfill it either, they needed to explain that far too late at the affirmative. Let's talk about accountability then, because this is your one and only path to victory, insofar as we mitigate it or symmetricize it, we still win the debate. Let's first talk about whether or not this creates accountability. The first thing what I'm going to explain here is that by the very own characterization that they brought at first affirmative, when individuals don't turn out to vote, that means that you don't get any accountability under the side of affirmative. The first thing to explain is that they literally concede to this at first affirmative, where they are like, oh, voter apathy is a problem. They say this creates an incentive to increase civil education and thus in the long run they're able to fix it. But they don't explain this either, because to, to the extent that this is something that is quite maximal in status quo, and that there already is quite a large amount of civic education, because people understand it's important to vote and people know all these things now, like we've lived in a democracy in most places for over hundreds of years, it explains why it's unclear that you actually get the rising of individuals turning up to vote such that you actually do get accountability under the side of affirmative. Truly, they don't explain this. But even if people do, uh, uh, to the extent that people don't care enough to vote, you don't get sufficient public scrutiny, you don't get anything that allows you to access accountability under the side of affirmative, they don't explain this to sufficiency. Let's talk about a second response here, because it, uh, it's unclear that the nature of elections are likely to be very conducive to public scrutiny in the first place. And the claim is very simple. I'm going to explain that in most instances, there are, there's uh, an insufficient amount of competition such that you're able to access public scrutiny in the first place. I know there are four reasons for this. First, there's an aversion to deaths in the military and there's an aversion to the individuals wanting to apply for it as a result of this. Secondly, the ability and the, 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 necess, uh, the necessity of having the campaign at a high personal cost for a lot of individuals means that individuals are less likely to want <coughs> the campaign in the first place. The third reason to suggest here is that being subject to personal attacks during elections, during personal debates, is quite stressful for an average reasonable person, which explains why individuals are less likely to opt into it when it is a direct democracy. But lastly, this is all uncertain. You opt into it knowing that it's unclear if you're going to get the job in the first place, and that often is the tipping point for a lot of individuals not wanting to campaign in the first place. And I'll note that this is quite damning. 
Because if you don't have a sufficient amount of candidates, if you don't allow individuals to actually represent their, their, their uh, preferences, if you don't actually have the sufficient amount of competition to be able to fix all the problems that they discuss to you, it is quite damning for the accountability metrics. They don't ex ever explain this. In the counterfactual, more individuals are likely to apply because it's a stable job. They're more likely to accept this under the side of negative. Clearly, it was better for accountability there. Let's talk about the military industrial complex because it's a buzzword that they throw around without explaining why this actually exists in status quo. The first observation I'm gonna make under this is that corporations existingly don't directly fund militaries. I'm not sure why this is true. There's strong legislation in status quo in most parts of the world to combat this. Obviously, you don't see Lockheed Martin giving money or like weapons to, uh, to militaries in status quo. Most of the time, it's governments funding militaries from the government budget. Maybe there exists some level of lobbying here. It's unclear that they ever arise to be capacity to fix this in the first place. And I'll note a lot of this legislation exists for the reasons that they claim, because it would be incredibly bad for military operations and it would be incredibly bad for the average citizen for this to occur. So they don't ever prove the premise that the military industrial complex was, other, was anything other than a boogeyman that you ought to care about. But even if this was the case, it's unclear that they fix it, because lobbying is still going to occur under the side of affirmative. They just back all the political candidates that are applying for the military position anyways. Obviously, they have the capacity to do so. And the intuition pump here is to suggest that this exists in most democracies in the world. Lobbying exists in most direct democracies now. They exist for most political candidates there. So if this hasn't been fixed in the past hundred years of democracy, how can affirmative fix this in a new model if they never explain this? But the last thing here is that even if this was the case, we've got this because when you force candidates to campaign, when they do this at incredibly high personal cost, it increases the incentives for them to actually take payouts from corporations in the first place because they need money to campaign. They need to be able to do things like voter outreach, to do things like pay Stuff. So it actually makes them far more beholden to corporate interests under the side of affirmative. It increases the incentives for them to actually appeal towards corporate interests to be able to have the ability to get into office in the first place. Whereas when it's direct, uh, when it's direct recruitment, you are less beholden to political interests. You are more beholden to the government that is democratically elected. The last thing here, the general public is just more vulnerable to corporate narratives in status quo. They have the most outreach and most political capital in status quo. So obviously they are far more proximately affected by this. The general average person is more affected in it by, than, than an elective government official that has technocratic knowledge. We explain very simple claims in this debate. One, individuals don't have information to vote in ways that are good. They say past experiences are sufficient, but only, obviously this is only true insofar as you can interpret past experiences within the lens of confidential information and information that goes against national security. So they don't ever sufficiently respond to this either. But we give you a slew of other reasons why individuals aren't able to do this well. People can't understand why past experiences matter and why something did in the past actually was a good political strategy. And we tell you that individuals are far more vulnerable to political tricks like populism, fear, and I know the military is specifically good at that. You ought to vote negative. as our work is uh, Elo Dance only response towards Ernst in which she maxed out how this entire election process works is that principles don't work if you don't prove an end to that outcome. We tell you clearly that the principle is a principal obligation to the military 
have towards your citizens on the ground. Therefore, the principle then fuels your shift away from catering or catering towards your pro imperialist ideas as to why now they shift towards catering towards public sentiment and why this then unlocks all the benefits that you talked to you about. I'm going to break their logic into three things. First, your entire logic lies on people and voter apathy. Ernzi has an entire premise as to how you combat, combat that, right? She tells you firstly, in terms of having some form of educational reforms, at the point of which you go into school, this is when people tell you that voting for your military is one that is important because this uh, principal harm that you can indicate at the point of which you have good military leaders. But secondly, we conceive to you to the fact that you likely have voter apathy in the short term, but the point of which social structures change and the importance of voting for this military is one that is realized by individuals of the public. This is likely the point of which individuals realize that this is an important resource. This is a salient decision that I have to do, and this is the point of which I go out and vote. But thirdly, at the instance that you have a bad military leader, and you see these harms that are being detrimented towards you as a site, and you see the trickle down, this is likely when you actively make the decision in order to go out and vote. All of this effectively combat the principal apathy argument that they want to talk to you about. The second logic that they operate on is the only people who vote are people who are going to be populist in nature. We mitigate this by telling you how elections means meaningful discourse. I'm going to weigh this later on and break the logic down even more as to how there's likely going to be levels within societies, as to how this discourse likely transcends your average individual on the ground, just breaking down the entire one, the tactics are tough. At the point of which you have discourse, that means you likely have some form of transition of information onto the people on the ground. This is when the people on the ground likely realize that this is one that is important and they likely realize what they are campaigning for or what they are actually voting for. Just this is important to note because this is when it expands the range of people who are voting from individuals of populist in nature. I don't want to plot logic that is, but towards your average user voter. But thirdly then, the logic that relies on military leaders who get into uh, positions of power are going to be inherently violent. Insofar as they don't prove to you why this nature is likely going to happen or why the mental wellness of a leader is immediately going to be benevolent, that is one that lies principally on you. But we tell you at the point of which we have these elections, that's likely the point of which why there's going to be a countervailing force in order for this narrative. That means when you have this change, that acts as a countervailing force and a check and balance towards your current social pro current problems with the status quo that you are principally solving. This means they have no standing for this argument whatsoever. It's simply assertions that they are putting out in terms of the people who voting are going to be a specific group or the individuals who are standing for elections are going to be benevolent in nature. In our worst case, judge, even if you don't buy any of this, just having that election by itself is an outlet that we have that allows people to make that change assuming that they want to. It's an independent tool in the toolbox that we have. If individuals feel that they want to make some form of change in status quo, if they want to make some form of change in voting for their leaders. This is something that they don't have to any way on their side because you lock individuals out of this agency. You don't provide them any form of outlet in order to use to make that form of change. First response then as to how we confront the case. I think their case principally on LO relies on the fact that this information is confidential and you're unlikely to understand this information at the point of which you don't understand the nuances of the military. I think firstly, yeah, obviously the information is probably going to be confidential. But first, this info is not going to be used in order to lobby your campaign anyway. Kavi clearly tells you why it's likely going to be your past experiences, your past precedences of success that your military has indulged in and your military has succeeded in. But I think we also tell you that it's likely going to be your future projections and future plans in order to further safeguard your city, in order to first further safeguard the points of um, protection towards your nation, right? This means your manifesto that you're using to campaign is an effective platform for your checks and balances that you want to use in order to tell people that, hey, these are the methods that we implement. I think you can have some form of scrutiny. You can have some form of complaints on to us at the point of which we don't implement the things in the realm manifesto. You're likely not going to posit this, um, your certain tactics or your certain strategies to people. That means your projections towards your future are still likely going to be remaining secret. I don't see why this was point of contention in this case. But secondly, even if you want to campaign on policies using your tactics, there is one that's extremely hard to understand. Firstly, there's levels of academia within public. That means the individuals within public operate on different levels of uh, ideas and different levels of knowledge. Judge, this is important because this is a public election and everyone has the means to elect. That means you likely have discourse and discussions from academicians that happen, meaning people who are smarter are likely going to break down this knowledge down to people who are poor people who probably don't understand these facts. 
no judge. At the point of which your society operates on means of social media, that you have platforms to individually channel this knowledge back to individuals on the ground, this is likely when you break down discourses much more easier. This is when you break down complex theories and problems that they posit to you that your regular <coughs> individual probably won't have onto people on the ground. But secondly then, once it's a norm, we tell you that social structures effectively change. It's a principle, that's a clear analysis given to you by Ernst as to how this affects the way people think and understand it. At the point of which you understand that if the importance of voting is one that is principal to you and one that is proximate to you, this is when you shift the ordinary citizen's knowledge as to one that is likely going to be elevated. At the point of which you're exposed to this thing every four years, this is when you likely have some form of expertise knowledge or at least some form of elevated knowledge and what you had the previous four years as to the importance of voting, as to what the uh, manifesto would likely entail and how you're going to effectively have these checks and balances towards these military leaders. All of this effectively just take out their entire uh, premise as to how this is one that is confusing and how this is one that is likely going to be impacted. But I think the, the mismatch weighing that they do on LO and DLO as to how this and how the kind of straw man case as to how we concede on having bad leaders being elected in the first place. No judge that our short term harm that we are conceding is on voter apathy. It's likely at the point of which you don't have to vote, uh, don't have voters who care for these people as much, you're likely going to have military leaders or probably go. But at the point of which you have that form of uh, change within society, this is when you likely are able to go out and make that decision. Just how we weigh out why you cannot use your rhetoric and uh, tactics of how you're not going to understand. And he clearly talks to you as to how voter apathy is one that is not going to work and where we're going to overturn the voter turnout at the point of which you have effective education and the point of which you have effective change in the society. But secondly then, the entire argument of how they're easy, easily going to get troops and how we to be uh, in power. I think firstly, it's very important to judge this debate on what we posited to you. I'm going to firstly defend the democracy. Right? Did posit to you that the entire point of democracy is one that is probably going to work and one that is probably going to be impure as well. At the point of which we specifically tell you why this breakdown happens, why people will be more in tune and more likely to buy into this narrative of voting, here's where we preserve democracy by itself. But why there's going to be an effective check and balance of society then? Judge, it's important to note at the point of which you vote, you shift the degree or you shift the narrative of the government's catering or pampering towards your pro-imperialist pro structures and catering to your corporations like Shell and Lockheed, like what Kavi has told you, towards catering towards your public sentiment now. At the point of which you tell them that this is what we want to do, that acts as an effective check and balance in order for you to hold this people accountable. I think this is when you sever the link in able to counter these pro-imperialistic structures into shifting it towards public sentiment. I think it's very important to note that judge. The public sentiment is one that's important, the point of which is the individuals that you're voting because of all of these reasons that are proposed. Uh, I thank Peter F. the fine speech. Four points of fact. running on the metric of saying how they're going to use the military doesn't particularly work because the macro scale things are not in control of the military leaders. That's what the politicians do. It says so in the info slide. They're still subservient to the decisions of, of the executive. But secondly, the role of the military leaders in this debate are much more organizational and much more small, small scale. It's when you send in specific batons of troops. It's where you decide to bomb. It's things that oftentimes the military is not publishing because where the troops are and the location of the bombing is not something that's shown to the public because it would alert the other side in the battle and it would put your troops in danger. Which means half of the things that the military leaders do will never be seen by the public. It's things that people necessarily will 
never known. Which means a lot of their mechanisms about how you'll hold them accountable if they do bad things when they're in power will never be accessed because the population will never know whether or not they did bad things because this is not published to the people. Because you cannot run on a platform of whether or not you'll go to debt, um, whether or not you'll go to war and the macro decisions because these uh, military leaders never made that choice. Which means a lot of the mechanisms that this team relies on for them to win, the principle of democracy and the way um, and accountability mechanisms to mean if they do bad things they'll get voted, in, voted out at the end of five years, were never actualized because they never proved why people had enough information to actually hold them accountable in the first place. So the only way, and the only way for this opposition team to win is if you believe that these people are going to war and making macro level decisions which people fully understand, which was never the case really in the first slide. What I'm going to start with is what's certain in this debate. The first thing that's certain is that at first this opposition team concedes there are short term arms of electing bad candidates. And I just want to explain what this means and weigh this to more extent. It means troops are sent in to die in unnecessary places because these people are worse at deciding when, 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 like it is, when the risks are worthwhile and the tactics they use are worse, which means more people die. It means defenseless victims are killed more often because these people are more likely to bomb certain villages because, that, um, because they were elected on a, on a campaign of fear, as opposed to a, a politician who knows what they're going to do and their history of where they bomb. It means in a bunch of simul if a bunch of simultaneous bad leaders are elected, it means tensions are much more likely to be spread and wars are more likely to begin. And at the onset of this debate, they have a huge certain harm, which is that the military operates in worse ways with worse tactics and more people die. Which explains why they have a massive burden to get over for you to credit any of their impacts. On their side, people die. On our side, if that's so, is less. Their claim here goes, if it's bad, we can kick them out at the end of five years. But I, but I would just suggest, even if you believe that mechanism, those people have already died. The villages have been burned and, people are, like, and people's lives have been ruined. They cannot get over that. The second thing I want to suggest is certain is that we would tell you that people just don't have enough information. They try and mitigate this by saying campaigns will run and show the information and there'll be increased transparency. But note how this is just mitigation. The public will never have all the confidential information. They'll never have true performance. They'll never have the histories of accusation. And this is all what we've told you at first. Conversely, politicians are more informed and they will always make the better decisions. This opposition team needed to prove within their substantive speeches why politicians will select bad candidates to activate any harms, which they have not done, and it is not a premise that they've engaged with. And in the absence of this premise, this team has no delta, because they have never explained why politicians are making bad choices, which should just suggest that politicians are making good choices in the status quo. So at the very worst, they have not proven any reason why the candidates that have already been elected are bad. Under our side, however, we have suggested that people have less information. Conversely, politicians have all the information, which is a very simple reason for you as an adjudicator to believe that on our side, the people who are being elected and the, have more information, and the, like the, people who are, um, the people who are making the choices of who gets these roles have more information and are better at making this decision, which should just, at the onset of this debate, explain why we have better candidates. First question I will ask is to go into more depth on this question. Who elects better candidates? We say two very simple reasons. One, people don't have access to confidential info, and two, the rhetoric of fear affects the election in a great way. The response to the second one that this team wants to rely on is that the world is not populist, and this means that populist rhetoric won't happen in, like, elect in elections of the military. But I would just note, think about examples of elections that have been based on the military decisions in the past. This looks like um, the military, um, this looks like elections post 9-11. It looks like Lyndon B. Johnson in the Vietnam War, who campaigned on a rhetoric of fear, because these were the people, um, because like, uh, the, you know, like they were fearful of the communi like of the rise of communism. Which is just to say, when military decisions are the thing that influence the outcomes of the, of the election, it is far more likely that populism and like the rhetoric of fear is much more commonplace. And this is because populism doesn't work well on social or economic outcomes, because there are a diverse set of things that people care about in economic outcomes. People, some people like high taxes and, and, and high welfare, other people like low taxes and low welfare, which means it's hard to uh, go to the, the entire population because everyone is very split. But something that connects everyone is a sense of nationalism. It's saying that person is the enemy and we need to fight them. It's very easy to scapegoat them in the sense of war. And it's very easy for the candidates to run on these platforms. It is very hard, conversely, to run on a military platform of saying nothing at all, which is what this opposition team would suggest, which is why populism is much more likely to affect instances of military outcomes as opposed to other outcomes. They say, you don't vote on how they run the military, you vote on what they say they'll do and the macro sale decisions. But this is what politicians do. They choose when to go to war. Running the military is much more about the micro level of when you send the troops in and how you deploy people and the tactics that you use. As I mentioned in my introduction, this team never gets around that. 
The next question I'll ask is who gets more accountability? Their claim goes, in the status quo, military panders to, um, the military panders to military industrial complex as it gives them money. The first thing I would suggest here is it's unclear the military makes these decisions in the first place because uh, they only suggest that they inform the pol like, the, pol like the, the, the executive branch if they should go to war, and that decision is influenced. But that's a very small scale mechanism. Obviously, the politician would just choose not to go to war if there's no reason to go to war. But secondly, it's unclear that these money of these companies actually provide money to the military in the first place. Like the military buy shit from the military industrial complex. The military industrial complex doesn't give them money. So this is not this, this is not the flow of money. But secondly, the alternative world would just be like bribes and fraud. Like you cannot lobby a military candidate because they're not running an electoral cycle. How lobbying works if you donate money to their political campaign. You can't just give money to a military candidate. That would literally be bribery and that's illegal. But secondly, lobbying gets far worse on that side because now these are campaigns and donations and lobbying that actually influence these military campaigns. But secondly, it empowers the military to act in more harmful ways because they have a democratic mandate. Conversely, on the outside, the president and the prime minister can dismiss them as um, as they are um, as they as the president and the prime minister pick them. Which is just saying, if the, if the military candidate does a bad thing, the president or prime minister can kick them out of their role. But under their side, that doesn't happen. So when uh, uh, someone does something bad, on their side they have five more years, under our side they can get kicked out. Conversely, uh, at the end of this, it is deeply unclear why the military industrial complex is actually like the, why the military is affected by the inter military industrial complex. But they are certainly <coughs> affected under their side because now the military industrial complex has an incentive to lobby them. But I would just suggest it is much worse if lobbying is given to an elected military leader rather than normal politicians because the military industrial complex is 100% of the lobbying that goes to military candidates, but it's only a small percent of the money that goes to other candidates because you know the environmental movement, the miners, like a bunch of other things lobbying the big candidates. Which means the big candidates are the, that are running for prime minister only are sm affected by lobbying in a small capacity, whereas on their side, the military leaders are affected 100% because the only people lobbying them are the military industrial complex. Which just explains why on their side, the lobbying of the military industrial complex gets far worse because these people lobby the military leaders much more. Their final hope and suggestion is the principle. Their claim he goes, war is proximate to everyone and we deserve the same. Generally, as my second speaker described, this principle falls apart on a couple levels. One, the Reserve Bank and the Supreme Court are already, like, are already appointed by governments because governments have a better understanding of who is the best technocrat to make this decision. The people do not, that's why we don't give them this power. But secondly, obviously the impacts of the military are not distributed evenly. No, rich people have the most say and are affected by the military the least. Uh, this is not true for other decisions. We would suggest at the end of this debate, this opposition team all the best candidates, and that's pretty bad, and they go to war more, and that's even worse. Thank you. I think that's the next for the final speech. And call upon the next slide to close the case. That's it. Of course, yeah. No, no. I started to do this in reply. It's like, dude. team has literally no path to victory. The first question I want to ask is, is there a principled harm to not voting? And let's be very charitable at the outset of this. They say, and they concede from first affirmative, in a poor attempt at preemption, that there's a short-term harm. But if more people die and more violent people get elected, that is an irreversible harm, right? So if even if they get that short-term harm and in the long-term democracy gets better, you have an irreversible severe harm that you ought to weigh against a vague democratic representation that if there is apathy, you cannot weigh them, weigh that because people don't care about that principle and therefore they don't opt into that principle. But we also explain at first and second that people just don't vote in the first place because it's not proximate to them and there's an increasing trend of low voter turnout. At 3A, they say, we don't prove military and we don't prove things, but, we tell you a number of things that go unresponded to. The first is that elections by nature require you to be majoritarian because you get a majority and that's how you get elected. So you lobby the majority, you lobby the dominant ethnic group within the country. Use your intuitions as the average reasonable voter. This is what happens in the status quo. This is how many far-right like parties in Europe have been elected. This is how far-right communities such as in India, then the BJP, are being elected in the status quo. So, if you lobby the majority, even if our only harm is the minority, 
that is still severe because these minorities are more likely to die and they're already incredibly vulnerable within a specific country. So even if our harm is localized to a small set of people, we ought to care about that incredibly highly. How do we protect this on the comparative? The first is just that politicians have access to a shit ton of confidential information. Secondly, politicians often lobby like minority groups and that is important. So even if it's a small change in terms of the benefit, that still ought to exist and we ought to give the debate to negative. But secondly, we explain at second that there is no competition because a small number of individuals apply. They can see this at first. That is, it has to be a bunch of generals who apply to it in the first place. So if it's no competition or very limited competition, their democracy principle cannot function or is at least mitigated to a large degree. But if there is competition, we explain, you have to outcompete the other person or you have to outcompete the people that are standing for the elections. So this activates our harms. One, because you have to appeal to the most concrete intuitions that people have. Three concedes that you don't release confidential information. In the absence of confidential information, as we explained, is good, you have to appeal to things that are concrete to people. You have to do stuff like outweigh their other biases. So this looks like doing stuff like ultranationalism. This looks like doing stuff like scapegoating minorities. This looks like doing stuff like being like, we're going to be incredibly violent because we have to protect the country. At that point, one, you ought to weigh this on more people dying because you, as the military, you you lobby, sorry, you stand on the platform of more violence, and therefore, if you lobby and stand for that, like on that platform, you have to carry it out in order to stay in, to stay in power. But secondly, the only response to this are you elect on what they say, and this is based on past experiences. The first response that we explain is that just many people don't have access to past experiences because this is not a debate about the police. People just haven't engaged with the military in a vast majority of circumstances. They're very distant to individuals. People don't have access to the experience in the first place. But we flip this. Because the things that get the most airtime are the most violent things, the most nationalistic sentiments, the fact that those are the things that the media wants to cover because they're the most sensationalist. If there's a distance between the average individual and the military, the only thing that the, the person sees is stuff like the Vietnam War, as we explained at third. These are the things that the individuals have access to, and therefore that weaponizes all of our arms on the fact that more people die, get more violent people elected, and that is bad. This affirmative team, even if like a lot of the things we've made are symmetric, doesn't prove these things. We get a small, like, a, a large benefit on like individuals dying, and that's like less individuals dying. Yeah. Not much benefit. On extremely violent, but check back your notes panel, this was dropped in second and third. It was only mentioned in <coughs> first, because they know that this is an illogical outcome, it will never happen anyway. But note that the mythical claims coming from their side are things like people have no access to information, therefore leads to voter apathy. Note that this means that they actually defend status quo. Without actually engaging the harms of status quo, they came from first affirmative. They just say that, well, it's not actually that bad. But the thing is, they can't just say that everything is symmetric and things like that. Because on a scale of prob probability, we gave the unique benefit of an existence of agency and platform to curb the problems in status quo. It was never our burden to say we are going to make a perfect world. It's our burden to just tell you that there is an now a existing unique kind of accountability mechanism to be a countervailing force against the problems in status quo. They never engage with this, they just engage with the idea to push the unfair burden on our side to create a perfect world. Second, on the illogical outcome of bad and violent military leaders. Let's take a step back and actually dissect that fucking logic. First, it's based on how people don't care and so that people don't vote. They only engage with the idea because civic awareness already happens, but they don't actually engage with our other counter mechanism to say that we've conceded that bad outcomes may happen in the short term, 
But it is these bad outcomes exactly that is the tipping point to make people care more, to make people go out and vote more in the future election because we have told you <coughs> that these kinds of military are the most proximate to people if they fucked up. Their case only works if we are in an active war. Mm -hmm. But if we are in an active war, this debate is not about whether you want to vote to go to war or not. This debate is about you voting for general military. In the framing in first half, we already told you the role of military extends more than just war. It's also about national defense. It's all about providing safety for citizens when it comes to things like COVID-19, emergency declarations, flash floods, kind of like safety precautions, things like that. These things are more proximate to citizens compared to the fucking active war freebie that they want to bring in. Their case does not work, it only works in the content of active war. Next, this means the second kind of logic to prove bad environment military leaders is that therefore this means you only get populist votes. We only told you that the process of election is something that gives birth to discourse that severely mitigates this. But even so, there is a huge missing evidential link of why is it that populist votes suddenly lead to these violent bad leaders. And so far, the info slide has already provided the caveat to say that this will not happen because they're still under the authority of civil leaders. But also number two, even if this is true, we have uniquely have the agency at top platform. This means that if violent leaders are symmetric on their side, you leave the control to the hands of corporal backing and state propaganda to make the decision of you. That means that even if the military industrial still exists on their side, you still have problems of pro-war, pro-territorial expansion with no fucking kind of mechanism to actually prevent all of these from happening or at least have people to have the utility to voice out these things from happening. Next is that, is that note the new material in WIP as well when they say that how somehow this corporal backing will now go towards these kind of individual military leaders. This is new material, you shouldn't credit that. Lastly, moving on to the worst case, best case analysis. Our worst case, we have bad leaders with the bad decision, people die. We already told you that's unlikely, because that's fucking illogical. We have already checked the balances such as the info slides caveat and also the extra platform. We've already considered the short term harm. What is actually their best case? Their best case is just defending status quo without actually engaging what the harm the status quo are by merely just dismissing it. Therefore, then at the end of the day, problems such as nepotism, lack of transparency, unregulated military industrial complex still happens on their side on a scale of a worse harms on their side. Basically, at the end of the day, this has been the clearest affirmative diet. <laughs> Stay a bit for individual feedback, but I have adults to do because there are two rounds before lunch. I don't know why, but it is what it is. Um, <coughs> so if I have to leave, please approach my panelists, and you can find me during the socials or message me on Facebook or whatever. Uh, the second thing is that this debate was an uh, above average debate. So good job, uh, and um, I, the one piece of general feedback I think the panel had as a whole was that it was a little bit hard to break deadlocks within the round because the weighing metrics between teams were not as explicit as I think they could have been across both teams. But that, you know, that you, you'll figure out what that means during the OA. Okay, so um, decision. The panel was unanimous in that it was a close but clear win to the negative team. Um, the first thing I'm going to try and unpack is whether the F principle is strong enough to independently stand in the debate. So the construction of the F principle that suggests that agency must be exercised through the election of military leaders is this. First, there is a strong influence of the military in the country towards, uh, towards civilian leaders, towards the civilian population, and as, as a symbol of the country. The consequent outcome as a result is that there needs to be an outlet to express a desire for change given the strong influence that the military has. Nick has a couple of responses to this. The first is the response of apathy, that people don't care about this outlet. The F reply is that you can reduce apathy through education, but ultimately I think this is an insufficient response because the claim from NEC is that the existence of apathy means that the principle is weighed unimportantly. If you have to increase how much people care, it demonstrates that apathy exists and it demonstrates that people as a whole do not necessarily care as much about the ability to express their desire for change. Now, I want to point out, and this doesn't mean there is no reason to have military election of leaders. It just means that this, ha having this outlet for change can be outweighed more favorably by the harmful consequences that Nick talks about later on. 
The second response that NEC has is that agency requires information and the nature of the military precludes the ability to provide this information for two reasons. The first is the complexity of the information and the second is the confidentiality of this information. The strongest response that F has against this is that you can translate complex information to the people through uh, academia, for example, and professors telling the uh, population what this information looks like through different levels of discourse where discourse on social media man manages to sort of basically dumb down this information to the mass public. My first issue with this is that it is weakly mechanized. It is very un unclear to me if it is true that academics can or have the incentive to provide this information in a translated manner to the public. But I agree with F that there is no response from NEC. So I do agree that complexity itself is not sufficient as a reason for why um, there is incomplete information provided to the people. However, this does not deal with the confidential confidentiality claim from NEC. That there is there are specific benefits to confidential confidentiality because of troop movements, for example, because people are affected by uh, this when when troops are put in danger, for example. And and I think that the F response is just that there are some things that are known to the public is insufficient in explaining to me why those things are enough for the public to make an informed decision when it seems to me that lots of confidential information would matter in the eventual decision-making calculus of these military leaders as a result. So I do agree that if agency requires information, the public may not be provided with as much information as they need to make an informed decision. The third thing that um, uh, next is, is that society has understood this trade-off in other fields, like for instance, healthcare, uh, all the other ministries that don't get their own individual elections. So all of this, I, and this goes unresponded by F, I think all of this seems to suggest to me that while the principle does have some benefit, it seems that it is less important given all of this um, like, uh, explain, uh, rebuttal from NEC. The last thing to construct the principle from F is that this principle is necessary for checks and balances given the status quo of the sort of military industrial complex lobbying uh, military leaders um, and consequently the military putting corporate interests above uh, national interests. I think NEC has a number of weak replies challenging the existence of this relationship. They first talk about the, the direction of the flow of money which I think is kind of no. Um, and the second, the second they talk about who is being lobbied, right? They say that basically it's the civilian leaders that are being lobbied and not the military. I do think that given F's characterization that the two sort of work in tandem and civilian leaders look towards military leaders for some kind of advice, it is very plausible that military leaders will also be lobbied. And so I also think that that is a weak response. However, there are some decent mitigations from NEC that make me ultimately not believe that this military uh, lobbying problem is as useful for F as they claim that it is. The first is that lobbying is likely to increase when campaigns are a necessary condition for being in power. That means that when you need political capital to campaign, that will probably come from the lob um, increased lobbying in the first place, and therefore you'll be more beholden to these military, uh, in the, to the military industrial complex. And second, that the complex affects civilian elections as well in the status quo. So this seems like something that will occur regardless um, uh, and therefore, if they are going to lobby the civilian, civilian leaders, then the sort of pro-war sentiments, for example, that will uh, be downstream for that will affect both sides regardless. So I, I'm, I'm rather unconvinced that the status quo would be changed considerably just because of F's policies. Therefore, I think the second clash becomes what kinds of military leaders make better decisions, whether it is elected military leaders or unelected military leaders. Now, even though I have already explained why the principle cannot independently stand, I think the weighing of F's principle against this clash is still important because it helps determine the margin. The weighing that I get in third neck uh, is that good decisions are important because otherwise people die. Uh, and there are also just, uh, and also F says stuff like pro-war politicians that are in the pockets of these lobbies will send people into war and that's bad as well. I do think that both of these outcomes are a little bit far-fetched, but I do agree that it seems quite important that good decisions are made for the reasons that actually 1F gives to me, that they affect the country and the civilian population in all of these subtle ways as well, not just the people die mechanism. And so ultimately, because I think that there, is, there are downstream effects to a bad military, uh, that do more proximately affect the people, 
I weigh this as significantly more important than the principle because the principle is also not well constructed on F as I've, cre as I've mentioned before. So let's talk about what kinds of military leaders make better decisions. F says that the presence of a need to ap appeal to the population uh, will ensure that uh, people who are pro-war because of corporate backing do not get into power and therefore bad decisions aren't made. I think the net responses that I've elucidated earlier already deal with this to some extent. But I also think that the argument that um, following what the people want and the reforms that the people want is a good thing because these reforms are good fall into the assumption that these reforms are necessarily good in the first place, which I think net challenges by talking about how the civilian population can be easily manipulated into believing fear-mongering narratives coming out from campaigns, and consequently it is unclear to me whether these, these reforms are actually going to be good reforms in the first place. Next counter um, assertion is that there's going to be there's going to be better decision making because you now end up with people with more tactics and strategy and tactics and strategy are more important due, uh, like, like for the military. The F frame around this is that this only applies during active war. But I'm not convinced by this because I think intuitively the notion of tactics and strategies are also about contingencies and plans for war and not just during active war itself. I think it's implicit in uh, second neck and third neck when they talk about things like troop movements that it doesn't have to be about active troop movements but also about planned troop movements. So it's very unclear to me whether this analysis only applies to active war. So, if I believe that, this, this, uh, that having good military leaders also applies during peacetime, then I believe two neck claims. First, that the fear-mongering neck claim seems to be fair here. And I think the specificity of where populism applies seems to be the most important frame here. Because F's response is, but fear-mongering happens regardless, what I think Net is able to explain is that populism is most prevalent when it comes to nationalistic policies like the military and it is considered on, in first F that the military is a nationalistic construct that is symbolic in nature. Consequently, I think I am able to buy that because the nation rallies around the, uh, these nationalistic narratives, populism and fear-mongering is likely to be more salient in military elections than in civilian elections. Therefore, worse leaders will be elected. Second um, um, mechanism that I buy is that individuals who do not want to be part of this process because they are technocratic, for instance, and they're not charismatic personalities are less likely to opt into the system where you need to be elected. There are people who just want to avoid elections in general and consequently, these military leaders with good tactics, good strategy, but do not want to be caught up in a, in a military campaign would naturally opt out of the system and result in a worser pool and a lesser pool of candidates overall for the people to choose from. Therefore, you consequently get worse leaders. This is a uh, analysis from second neck that is unresponded by third neck and neck, uh, sorry, by, by third F and F reply. And consequently, I think it is good analysis that ends up standing the debate that demonstrates to me that, um, that good decision making more likely happens on neck than on F. Finally, on the idea of the lobbying thing, once again, I do feel like the neck counter about uh, how all of these broad military decisions still happens through civilian leadership as opposed to military leadership does negate a number of the ability for F to uh, access the impacts of you know, uh, uh, these um, uh, pro-war military leaders being able to screw things up even if pro-war military leaders are the ones who are promoted on the side of NEC. So I think that impact ends up being mitigated to some extent. So that's the way the call went. I'm happy to uh, uh, give individual feedback if necessary. Uh, if not, good luck for the rest of the day. I, it's a long day ahead. I think both teams will do fine uh, this tournament. So good luck. Yeah. Thank you.